All right, good afternoon. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Morgan Brown. Morgan is a graduate student in the um, biology program at JSU. Um, she was also an undergrad at JSU. Uh, now she is a, a GTA um, helping with the, uh, the Cure Lab for the, uh, the Beer Lab, it's called. JSU so, Brew. Yeah, yeah JSU Brew. And uh, she's working with me on a research project involving plant diversity and plant evolutionary history, and we're tackling one of the, the toughest groups uh, in terms of uh, sorting things out, and that is bamboo. Um, so with that, we'll work. Thank you, Dr. Triplett, for that thoughtful introduction. As I said, my name is Morgan Brown. This presentation is on cryptic hybridization in the temperate bamboos, asking is Cleoblastis simoniae a species of hybrid origin? So, if you didn't know, bamboos are actually a grass. In fact, they are the only major group of grasses that diversify in the forest. It's a really big group. It encompasses over 1,400 species and over 100 genera. And they grow everywhere. Um, they grow worldwide in temperate and tropical zones. So for those reasons, they are ecologically and they can be economically important, but they're also taxonomically complex, which I'll touch on later in this presentation. So before we get into kind of the meat and bones of this presentation, I want to establish the definition of morphological data. And this is data that are contingent upon the phenotype of an organism. Basically, so if you go out, look at a plant, it's what you can see, those plant parts that you can visually see with your eyes. So taxonomists use this way almost exclusively to identify plants in the field. Um, they use things like stem type, leaf, etc. But they also use really important other characteristics like the reproductive characteristics, so the flowers and the fruits. So if we look, let's see if this point works. Hopefully you can see that. If we look at the bottom of the dirt, this is a bald cypress tree. So they have a really diagnostic morphological characteristic, which are termed the knees, that come up from the base of the tree and from the swamp. And um, so if we look at the top, I think everyone can see that this is a classic sunflower. And the reason why you know that is because the morphological features, the reproductive features, tell you that. You can see that with your eyes, right? But there are problems with using morphological data. It can be misleading and undiagnostic. So plants that are unrelated may look really similar, and plants that are related look, may look really different. So I'm willing to bet that most of you in this room would classify both of these things as a cactus, right? But in fact, only one of these things is a cactus, and the other thing is not a cactus at all. They just have very similar morphological features that make them look the same. So using morphological features for identification can also be a huge problem in bamboo. For one reason is a problem is that they don't have really great flowering schedules. They're kind of a mystery. So we think about Japanese river cane. They only flower about every 30 years. And then our own giant cane native to North America flowers really infrequently. So the flowering schedules are not very helpful, and the flowers aren't helpful. In fact, when they do flower, the flowers are super similar, so it's still not quite that helpful. So taxonomists turn to vegetative features, such as cones, nodes, branching, and leaves to identify bamboos. And some characteristics, um, they, they are shared across genera and species level of bamboo, so it makes it really hard to identify morphologically. So, for example, this is one species of bamboo that scientists have gone out in the field, looked at it, and I think maybe the characteristics were a little confusing or a little similar across different species of bamboo. So they actually classified this bamboo in eight different genera and even more different species. And this is a common problem in bamboo. So there are many negative implications to misidentification. First, um, we get the wrong idea about diversity and evolution, so the history of the way these things are connected. Um, we can be steered the wrong way in our conservation efforts, and then in general, it just creates bad science. If we set a low standard for identifying plants, we set a low standard for identifying more than just plants. So to turn a corner, hybridization is when one distinct genetic line crosses with another and creates a hybrid. So you can think of it as one parental species, crosses with another parental species, it makes a baby. This is the driving force in biodiversity. And since these hybrids, or these hybrid babies, are morphologically um, intermediate, so they share the characteristics between their parents, um, hybridization can add uh, further to these misidentification problems. So natural hybridization in bamboos hasn't really been thought of as like a big deal or very prevalent in the history of bamboo until recently. So, for example, um, scientists found out that Japanese arrow bamboo is actually a product of two distinct different genera parent bamboo in Pleoblastis and Salsomorpha. So, this discovery has led to major revisions of bamboo names and a um, redo in the classification of the bamboo. So, when we talk about these bamboo that we don't think are hybrids, 
um, but they have actually undergone hybridization events in history. We classify those as cryptic hybrids, and you'll see this term a lot in this presentation. So of particular interest is the Japanese river king, Pleoblastis salmoniae. This bamboo is native to Japan, where it's known as meidake. Um, and it's everywhere, it's really widespread, so it's economically important. But this bamboo is also important in the history of Japan in um, rural, rural farm life because it is used in uh, roof thatching, fences, and other um, structures like that. So data from Triplett and Clark have alluded to the fact that this uh, bamboo may actually be a cryptic hybrid between species in sections Nasosa and section Pleoblastis. But the problem is that right now this bamboo is actually treated as a distinct species in its own uh, section Medakia. So we have some compelling yet conditional evidence from that Triplett and Clark paper as to why we think Japanese river cane may actually be a cryptic hybrid. The first piece of evidence is a clustering analysis. So it looks at um, fingerprint data and you see these clusters here. These are the dis genetically distinct um, major groups of bamboo. And then in between them are the hybrids that fall out in the intermediary spaces. So I mentioned the Japanese aero bamboo earlier, so does Salsa japonica. You can see as a hybrid, it falls out between these major groups, Pleoblastis and Salsa morpha. But I want you to pay more attention to the whole group of Pleoblastis, where it has three distinct groups. So it has section Pleoblastis, which are the southern bamboo, section Nasosa, which are the northern bamboo, and then right in the middle falls out section Maidakia, which is the Japanese river king. So it's interesting because the Japanese river cane sort of acts like a hybrid, right? It falls out in the middle of these two distinct groups. Another key piece of evidence from that paper is this um, split tree analysis, which is a tree-based analysis. You basically look at the same exact data we just saw, but look at it in a different sort of way. So this is like a family tree where the genetically distinct group of bamboo, they'll come out on their nice clean groups. Um, and, but if we look here at the red arrow for Pleoblastis salmonia, we see that there are these boxing effects, or I like to call it the spider webbing. So what happens is, this is called a character conflict. Um, if Pleoblastis salmonia is in relation to the two bamboos that it's in the middle of, it'll draw those bamboos in towards it. So it'll create this boxing effect. And it'll skew the branching so it doesn't look like a nice, clean line. So while those pieces of evidence are really interesting, they don't tell us exactly if Pleoblastis salmonii is a hybrid, and they don't tell us what Pleoblastis salmonii is a hybrid of, so who are the parents. This leads me to my objective of studying and testing Pleoblastis salmonii to see if it's a cryptic hybrid. So my current study, I utilize AFLPs and in-DNA sequence data, where AFLPs are DNA fingerprint data, and I'll call them DNA fingerprint data throughout this presentation. It's a way to compare individuals across um, the whole genome of DNA. Um, and nuclear DNA is sequence data that compares specific um, sequences of DNA, so specific genes from the nuclear genome. So all of this is based on field work completed by Dr. Triplett in 2008. And this is a map of Japan where he has gone and collected all these different species of bamboo across Japan. So my first analysis is a phylogenetic tree of a gene called PV cell 1 alpha. This is the nuclear DNA I talked about earlier. So the interesting, interesting thing is um, that Pleoblastis salmoniae actually has two versions of the same gene, or alleles, where one allele tracks the northern bamboo and another allele tracks the southern bamboo. So it could be alluding to the fact that one allele tracks parent one and one allele tracks parent two. This is a pretty diagnostic sign of hybridization when there are alleles for one certain gene that attract two different parents. So another analysis I conducted was the same one you saw earlier, the split tree, where you're basically looking at a family tree. Um, and this one not only included the two groups, so the northern and the southern bamboos. The southern bamboos are to the left, and the northern bamboos are to the right. So if you look, they have um, pretty distinct groups. They have really nice branching. Um, but I want you to pay attention to these two specific species within the parental groups. So Pleoblastis hunziae, which is the southern bamboo, and Pleoblastis chino, which is the northern bamboo. I want you to pay attention to that because when I add Pleoblastis salmoniae to the mix, which is in the blue square, it repositions those species closer towards it. So if Pleoblastis salmoniae has a shared characteristics with two likely parents, again, it's going to draw those parents in towards it in this family tree. So for that reason, we think that Pleoblastis chino might be punitive parent number one, and Pleoblastis hunziae might be punitive parent number two. 
So another type of analysis I did is a structure analysis. This is an ancestral analysis that looks at all the data you give it, so all the AFLP fingerprint data, and it infers the likely popula ancestral populations, um, so where these things could come from potentially. And then it will assign each individual, so each bar, to the specific ancestral populations. So what we recovered, which this looks green on my computer screen, yellow in this presentation, but what we recovered is that one ancestral population, um, the northern bamboo, is assigned to pretty much completely to that ancestral population. And the southern bamboo, which is an orange, is pretty much completely assigned to the other ancestral population. But if we look at Cleoblastis simoniae, it doesn't have its own ancestral, ancestral population, it doesn't have its own color. It looks like a 50% hybrid composite between populations number one and populations number two. So the last type of analysis I did was a new hybrid analysis. This is just to further test my hypothesis that Blue simoniae or Japanese river cane is in fact a hybrid. So what we recovered is in the blue, Pleoblastis simoniae looks like an F1 generation. This is the um, first generation hybrid, which is a cross between parent one, which is in the red. This is the northern bamboo. And parent two, which is the green, this is the southern bamboo. So it looks like that Pleoblastis simoniae is in fact a direct hybrid cross between parents number one and parents number two. So if you don't have any genetic background, you don't know what these programs are, um, you're not very familiar, I think it's still very clear to see that in every case, Pleoblastis simoniae or Japanese river cane comes out in the middle of these two parental lines. And it leads me to conclude that um, this supports our hypothesis that Japanese river cane is in fact a hybrid between Pleoblastis china and Pleoblastis hydesia. So um, when we think about evolutionary history and family trees, we kind of think of them as like a really nice clean branching where everything splits off really nicely, it's easy to think about. But really, this highlights the fact that sometimes it's more like a web where we have these cryptic connections and these twisted turns. So as biologists, this is still an ongoing process to figure out what's actually happening here. Moreover, it highlights the importance of using molecular data in plant identification, not just those morphological features. Um, and so this study and others like it, like that Triple and Clark paper, other ongoing studies, they highlight the complexity of this biodiversity and the importance of understanding these genetic relationships in a historical context. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Jamie, Jamie Triplett, uh, Brian Long, who is a fellow researcher in our lab, the JSU Valley Department, and the JSU Herbarium. Do you have any burning questions? I just did the perfect job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you guys. <laughs>